Everyone, can I ask everyone to settle down and we can start the afternoon's proceedings. Um, apologies for the slight delay in the, in the start. We had a few logistical issues to attend to. Um, but, Auntie Farida, we're back. We're back. Uh, it's such a wonderful feeling to be back here in the School of Public Health uh, with yourself, with Rahmat, with, La with Latifa, with many of the other family members and friends of the Omar family. Um, and uh, when we planned this event, we were really not sure whether anyone would show up because we are so used to doing these things online. Everyone likes to view these things from the comfort of their homes. Um, but the fact that so many are here, I think, is really phenomenal. Uh, it's clear that we're all longing to listen to, engage, and meet with one another again in person. And I'm really uh, happy that so many of you made the effort to come all the way out to the University of the Western Cape from wherever you reside or where you work to come and join us this, this afternoon. It's also a testimony to the legacy of Dalla Omar. Uh, it has been 18 years since he exchanged this world for the eternal. But the turnout today, I think, shows that his legacy is monumental and enduring. He continues to spread warmth. So thanks, everyone, for supporting this memorial lecture. My name is Yaab de Fisser. Uh, I work for the Dalla Omar Institute. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to chair this afternoon's proceedings. Uh, it's also being broadcast uh, live on YouTube, so be careful where you scratch and what face you pull, because we're being watched. Uh, also, we encourage those of you who are on social media to share your reflections on tonight. And if you do so, please use the hashtag, hashtag Dalla Omar or hashtag 2022DOML, Dalla Omar Memorial Lecture. Now, there's an organization that is threatening to disrupt the proceedings. They have done so before. We all know them. They go by the name of ESCOM. Um, <laughs> So there may or may not be a slight interruption. We're a little bit uncertain whether or not it will happen. But if ESCOM knocks on our door, we should have a backup generator. Uh, but please bear with us. I'm sure we're all used to this phenomenon of having to cope with load shedding. But we'll make uh, everything happen uh, as planned as far as we can. We have a full, uh, full program, so without further ado, let me uh, re request the Rector and Vice-Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape, Professor Tarum Pretorius, to welcome us this afternoon. Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Prof. De Fisser. No one could be more happier than me standing in front of a full School of Public Health building. It's been too long that we've lived apart from each other. It's been too long since we've had that meaningful personal relationships and personal contact. The university is partly a ghost town at the moment, but I do hope that as from January 2023, we will have that buzzing, thriving community back on campus. The, the, I, I saw the former SRC president walking in. Uh, he tirelessly campaigned last year to open up the university. Oh, there he is, to open up the university. And I'm sure he's claiming this as a victory. <laughs> Ms. Farida Omar, or Auntie Farida, as we affectionately know you. The rest of the Omar family and Rahmat Omar, uh, where's Rahmat? Apologies for my failing memory. Uh, it's just been too long uh, since we've been apart from each other. You are welcome as well. And I've just met uh, uh, Auntie Farida's eldest grandson, and she seems very proud of him. Professor Tuli Madoncella, our guest speaker, former public protector and the Lord Trust Chair in Social Justice at the University of Stellenbosch, 
Welcome back to the university. Uh, the few occasions <clears throat> that we had the privilege to host you, you entertained all of us, and I'm pretty confident you will do so again tonight. If you look at the back of your program, you will see that you, in, that you join an illustrious host of guest speakers, and tonight it is no exception that we have another uh, illustrious, dynamic person uh, in South Africa speaking to us. Prof. Deval, Dean of the Law Faculty, Ashraf Mohammed, a member of the Dalla Omar Institute Advisory Board. Uh, I didn't see Judge Vincent Saldana unless he came in. Judge, uh, also a member of the uh, Dalla Omar Institute Advisory Board and a Western Cape High Court judge, uh, Mr. Christopher Fry, if he is present, who is a member of the Western Cape Provincial Legislature, and then uh, Councillor Patricia van der Ross, who also indicated, are oh, there's Councillor van der Ross. I saw you on the TV this morning with the, the fake food inspectors. Interesting things that keeps you busy. Prince Zulu, representing the King Mrs. Zulu Foundations, present. Not present. All guests, my colleagues in the law faculty, uh, there's some humanity scholars as well. Uh, <laughs> there's some humanity scholars and there's scholars from other faculties. Uh, you are all welcome. This is a special occasion for the University of the Western Cape for many reasons. And we are so pleased to have it in person once again. One of those reasons is that this lecture series allows us to celebrate and honor a, man who, a man's life from whom selfless service was a cornerstone of his being. We remain indebted to the Omar family, and in particular uh, to Auntie Farida for allowing us to continue to honor Dalla uh, in this way. Another reason why this is a special occasion is that we, at these occasions, have the privilege to welcome and to honor renowned speakers who have impacted our society. This evening's speaker is no different. Prof. Madoncella remains the yardstick for the qualities that a public protector must possess to do the job effectively. Why did you leave? <laughs> Prof. Madoncella has shown courage and tenacity of spirit and is unafraid to speak truth to power. I was uh, a dean in 1990 and I had the privilege to rub shoulders with Dalla Omar. Often uh, his sharp intellect and his wit in, in Senate executive meetings was something to behold. As we gather here today to celebrate his life, I cannot help but think, what would Dalla Omar, given his values, given his selfless struggle, what would he make of present-day South Africa? What advice would he give to our government so that they can adjust the path that they are on currently? Because if you haven't known it by now, as a nation, as a country, we are on a perilous and a precarious path at the moment. What would the men and women of Dalla Omar's generation make of South Africa's unemployment rate that stands at 33.9% and youth unemployment that stands at 46.5%? What would they say about the millions of children who live in abject poverty? The millions who do not have a future and who do not see a future for themselves. 
In 2020, 51%, 10.5 million children were classified, and 8 million children were living below the food poverty line. In other words, they were not getting enough nutrition. The triple challenge of high poverty, high inequality, and high unemployment persists. And we have to keep on asking, what is our government intending to do to solve these dilemmas? We are at a stage, I'm afraid, where grand plans, strategies, no longer install confidence. We, as a country, as a citizenship, we want to see decisive, thorough actions, not just planned, but implemented and monitored. South Africa needs leaders that genuinely care about their people and not about their positions. As I stand here tonight, and knowing Dalla Omar's values, I'm convinced that Dalla Omar and his comrades of that generation would expect no less of our government. Because they were men and women of action. When they were asked to serve our country, they rolled up their sleeves and dedicated themselves to the betterment of their people, often, to a high, often at a high cost to themselves and to their loved ones. Given this context, we really look forward to what I know will be a thoughtful and inspirational input from Prof. Madon Sala on how we can reimagine democracy. Enjoy what I know is going to be a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Pretorius. Let me also say that the Dalla Omar Institute is immensely proud to be part of and make a contribution to this wonderful university. And we thank you and your team for your leadership. Your support and the support of your office, uh, not just for this event, but also for the Institute in general, is something we value tremendously. Now, we've been in close consultation with Farida Omar in the run-up to this event. Uh, and we're, again, so grateful that we can organize this together with you and with the rest of the Omar family. Now, last week, Auntie Farida phoned me and asked me if she can say something to welcome our guests. And I said, well, Auntie Farida, the program is very full. It's already printed. But you can speak whenever you want. You can say whatever you want to say, and you can speak for however long you want to speak. Uh, so if you want to come up to the stage, we would welcome you. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. First of all, I want to say very warm welcome to each of you who has made a special effort to be here with me today. First of all, I want to say thank you very much to the great professors of the University of the Western Cape and to welcome our guest speaker tonight. And secondly, I want to say to our great professors Thank you very much for always being so kind to me, and especially my Debbie. I just love her very much. She's very, very kind to me. And lastly, I want to say, I'm looking very, very forward to hear what my grandson is going to say about his grandfather <laughs> when, when, he, when he will give the vote of thanks for his dad, for his granddad. Thank you very much. <laughs> that many of you are aware of the role that Auntie Farida herself played in the struggle against apartheid. The indignities, the sacrifices, and the dangers were so many, and we may never forget the contribution that she, she has made herself to the struggle against apartheid. I had the absolute privilege to listen and be mesmerized by the stories, the anecdotes of her life, 
fighting alongside Dalla against the evil apartheid regime. About the unity movement, the ANC, the harassment by the security branch, the multiple times Dalla was detained, the attempted assassination, but also heartwarming stories about how she accompanied and looked after so many spouses and children on their visits to ANC activists in jail. Looking after Winnie Madikizela Mandela as she visited Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, accompanying Mandela Mandela with a parcel of curry as he visited his grandfather in Polsmoor, sending a fruit parcel to Robben Island with Mandela's attorney and hearing back that he loved the banana so much because he hadn't eaten a banana in years. Now these are amazing, rich, and important stories of warmth, humanity, compassion, and perseverance. Thank you, Auntie Farida. Let's now listen to the UWC choir. They are sitting there on the right. They look magnificent. Uh, they will render an item in music. The UWC choir is led by Mr. Sibusiso Nyeza. We're very proud to have them here. They are such a wonderful resource on this campus, and we look forward to the music. Over to you.
Now, Sibu Siso told me that, um, of course, many of the members of the choir are students and they are writing exams at the moment. So they uh, had to pull themselves away from studying and from writing exams to be here with us. So we're really grateful. We can't give you extra marks for, for this, but <laughs> you do deserve it. You do deserve it. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll hear more of them later. Uh, let's now turn our attention to our main speaker. Uh, we are so thrilled to have Professor Maroncella with us. We had convinced her to deliver the lecture in May 2020, um, but there was a small matter of the COVID pandemic that ruined our plans. So we're all the more grateful that she was willing to reignite those plans, and, and here we are. But let me hand over to my colleague, Professor Tenash Chikwata, to formally introduce our main speaker, after which we will go straight into the lecture. Uh, Professor Chikwata is an associate professor in the Institute and leads our program on multi-level government. He's one of the hardest working colleagues in the Institute. Uh, so over to you, Tanash. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yab Difisa. My job this evening is easy but also difficult. It is easy because our key note speaker is well known to us. Her record speaks for itself. It is difficult because she has a long CV. In the interest of time, let me touch on what my eyes cannot miss and what my ears hurt the most. Professionalism, integrity, accountability, steadfastness, fearlessness, exemplary leadership, soft-spoken. These words quickly come to mind every time I come across her name. She has always been passionate about how law saved social justice from as far back as the 1980s. Since then, she has made a significant mark in South Africa's history as a human rights lawyer. Alongside Dalla Omar and many others, our keynote speaker was involved in the struggle against apartheid and the fight for democracy. She assisted with the drafting of the 1996 Constitution. From 1987, she worked in several government-related institutions, such as the Office of the Status of Women, the Presidents, the Independent Electoral Commission, and the Department of Justice. She also served as a full-time commissioner of the South African Law Reform Commission. Our keynote speaker has also held various leadership positions in civil society and related organizations. She taught at various universities and provided legal training and human rights and other issues. As an advocate for gender equality and the advancement, advancement of women, she's a member of several associations that seeks to advance the interests and rights of women. She has founded and co-founded many organizations, including the Tuma Foundation and the African Ombudsman Research Center. Of all her high-profile positions, her role as the public protector between 2009 and 2016 clearly stands out. In this esteemed position, our keynote speaker served with distinction, dedication, efficiency, and professionalism. She defended the people of South Africa against corruption, maladministration, and other ills with fortitude. In 2016, she assumes the role of the head of the Law Trust Chair in Social Justice at the University of Stellenbosch. The chair undertakes a responsive research and teaching on social justice with the overall objective of ensuring that we have a society where the enjoyment of rights and freedom is not dependent on class, gender, among other human diversities. It is towards this endeavor that the chair coordinates academic, business, and broader civil society input to support government efforts towards tackling the twin challenges of poverty, inequality, facing South Africa today. Our keynote speaker is an accomplished author and co-author of several publications, including books, chapters in books, journals, and handbooks. Her work in 
and outside of government has received local, regional, and international recognition. She is the recipient of several awards, prizes, and fellowships, and was awarded by many universities with a Doctor of Law degree. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker tonight is a staunch defender of the Constitution. She has taught us that we should be concerned not only about, our, not only about, our, about ourselves, but also about the well-being of others, especially the poor. Her emphasis on ethics-based leadership is a key feature of a contribution to the public discourse. In a time when we are witnessing the backsliding of democracy, not just in South Africa, but the world over, we are looking forward to hearing what Professor Tulima Donsela's view on reimagined democracy through a social justice lens reflecting on Dalla Alma's legacy. Without further ado, please help me to welcome to the podium the keynote speaker for the 13th Dalla Alma Memorial Lecture, Professor Tulima Donsela. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Firstly, I would like to thank the University of the Western Cape for the privilege to present the, the 13th Dalla Oma lecture and extend a special greeting to all of you who have come to honor this great South African and great human being. And I also want to thank the choir for joining in in honoring the peerless Dalla Omar. But before I speak, I would like to extend a special greeting to the leadership that has made it possible for us to gather today. Um, I would like firstly to extend my greetings to Professor Yap Defisa. Thank you, sir, for the privilege to be here. To the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tyrone Pretorius. Thank you, sir and for the kind words, and of course to the Dean of Law, Professor Jacques Deville. None of this would be possible, at least for me, if it was not for the Omar family, led by Umama Farida Omar, who have kept this legacy alive, and this is the 13th year of celebrating it. I understand that this initiative celebrates the memory of Dalla Omar as a person who worked tirelessly towards and achieved so much in realizing the goals of human rights and democracy. I was privileged to find myself on a front row seat as Dalla Omar pursued and achieved some of the human rights and democracy milestones that remain his enduring legacy to date. You'll agree with me that these milestones also serve at a time like this as bridges of hope regarding the possibility of realizing the dreams that powered the struggle for freedom and democracy that Dalla Omar and his peers believed in. We've already heard that one of those peers was our iconic first president of democratic South Africa, Nelson Mandela. And my being in the front row seat as one of Dalla Omar's employees placed me 
in that situation of seeing how these two Democrats worked together. Firstly, to make the Constitution possible, because you will recall that the Constitution was finalized in 1996, two years into democracy, whilst we were governing on the basis of the interim Constitution. We will also remember him as the person behind the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and who made sure, at least according to Prof. Andre de Toy, that the Truth and Reconciliation process was not shrouded in opacity, that ordinary people were able to talk publicly about their experiences, and that those amnesty hearings were not happening in dark spaces where nobody gets to know what was said and what was not said. And of course, if anybody lied, people had an opportunity to contradict them. For me, I'll say it was our shared search for justice anchored in shared humanity that brought us together. It's been indicated that Dalla Omar and I were both involved in the struggle, but interestingly, I, had, I didn't have much contact with him during the struggle, or even during the constitution drafting process. What I know for sure about Omar is primarily based on my interaction with him initially during his engagement with us as civil society, as soon as he was appointed as the first Minister of Justice in democratic South Africa. There are people who talk left and walk right. He was not one of them. There's also people who say a lot about democracy but the way they make decisions is very autocratic, and he was not one of those. I was still working at Verts when I got involved in his conception of many of the thoughts that eventually drove the transformation of the Department of Justice, integrating 11 apartheid departments of justice. But my work with him starts fully in September 1995 up to mid-1999. Under his leadership, we conceptualized Justice Vision 2000, the framework for transforming the judicial system and state legal services. I've said today I'm going to speak about reimagining democracy from a social justice lens, reflecting on Dalla Omar's legacy. One of the things I would like you to consider is when it came to creating a planning unit that eventually was at the core of the transformation process, Dalla Omar did not look at America, UK, and all of those democracies that are very much focused on business and capitalism driving society. He looked at societies that had similar constitutional aspirations as us. And those were Sweden, Denmark, and even Germany. Those were the places we went to. The planning unit was funded by the Danes, and we were trained by a real army general on strategic planning. And that's what drove Justice Vision 2000, a very clear vision-driven process, which governed the transformation process throughout his five-year term. So nothing was done transactionally. My colleague, Prof. Guopman, says 
when you are leading a process, you need to keep three things in mind. What's the picture you see at the end of that process that you're leading? What are the principles that will govern your process of moving from where you are to where that picture takes you? Thirdly, what is the plan? And is there resonance between the plan, the picture, and the principles? And of course, I've added to Prof. Goldman's approach action because you can have a very good picture, very good principles, and a very good plan. If, like the NDP, you keep it somewhere in a corner, and then you do your own things, things are not going to move forward, and certainly not in the direction of the picture you have drawn. So, as I've indicated, he looked to Sweden, Denmark, and all of those social democracy countries for solutions on how to take South Africa forward. At that stage, we already had an interim constitution, so it was very clear what the interim constitution wanted us to do. And you will recall that it's been regarded as a breach. That is, S. versus Makwanyan said the interim constitution was a breach from our society of division, cruelty, and inequality to a new society based on recognizing the humanity of everyone, human rights and democracy. So obviously just from the interim constitution already, we were supposed to operate uh, differently. One of the things he's known for, according to Prof. Andre de Toy, he rejected opacity. And Andre de Toy talks about why opacity is a problem. I mean, one American judge once said, sunshine is the best of disinfectants. So when things happen in the darkness, vested interests rule. This is no accountability. But also when things happen in the darkness, not everyone is included. So even if you're not pursuing vested interests, you will not see what somebody else was going to see based on their own circumstances. So with the TRC insisted that it be an open process, he was a visionary. He was the ultimate strategist. But unlike others, he was not the kind of person who devises a strategy, puts it in a corner, and then walks somewhere else. Justice Vision 2000 truly drove everything that we, we, we did at the Department of Justice how we approach the transformation of the judicial system, how we approach the transformation of the legal services, and how we, trans we approach the transformation of the laws themselves. And during his time, many of the laws that were drafted were those that were required by the Constitution. For example, the Equality Act which was a partnership between Nelson Mandela and Dalla Omar himself. The interesting thing is now, Nelson Mandela gets blamed for the reason why we are unequal today. But both of these leaders were systems thinkers. Their understanding was that when a society is dysfunctional, it means the system is driving that dysfunctionality. So you can't just fix your labor laws and fix BEE, and then give others grants, and then say your system is now going to equalize. Interestingly, Dalla Oma knew and told us about how South Africa was manufactured, how inequality in South Africa was manufactured. <coughs> it was through a systems approach where everything was tinkered with. We know about land, the taking away of land was not an arbitrary thing. It was to do two key things. 
It was to create labor. So it was the businesses in South Africa, the mines and the agriculture people that needed labor, but they wanted it cheap because labor, slavery had just been banned. So they wanted labor cheap. And Prof. Tip Lines talks about that is unfree labor. Secondly, why land was taken away long before the 1913 Land Act, but primarily during the 1913 Land Act, it was to kill competition. So the mines and farms needed additional labor, but white farms were struggling with competition. And you'll find this information in Daniels versus Gribante, where Justice Froneman tells you the story of what happened. So Dalla Omar understood how the whole system went together. You tinkered with land, we tinkered with employment through the masters and servants laws. You tinkered with residential areas and ownership of business rights through the Group Areas Act and, and laws such as the Population Registration Act. And you tinkered with the education system after 1948 and dumped it down. So everything worked to create this extractive system, systematic framework of dispossession, oppression, preferential treatment, and exclusion. So this was Dalla's response, the Equality Act. And he fought for that act in parliament. One political party wanted us to go the anti-discrimination rule. And Dalla said, no, if you read section nine of the Constitution together with section seven two of the Constitution, section nine is the Equality Act, and section nine two says equality includes equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms, which means everyone should enjoy all rights and freedoms. But if you have the history of dispossession, <coughs> oppression, preferential treatment and exclusion, you would have an uneven playing field. So saying people can't be discriminated will not be enough. So you needed to even out the playing field. Hence, he fought for an equality act instead of an anti-discrimination act. We've done the same already with the Employment Equity Act in labor, and Tito Mboweni accepted our argument that we can't just have an anti-discrimination act, uh, and just before a democracy, they had come with an Equal Opportunities Act, which was just anti-discrimination. So we suggested an employment equity. So Dala Omar took that approach, anti-discrimination plus promotion of equality. But guess what? 22 years since the Equality Act was passed, the part of the act that was about auditing, enduring inequality, and progressively taking measures to reduce that inequality has not been implemented. The Equality Act was required by the Constitution. The Black Economic Empowerment Act was not required by the Constitution. Mwelet Zimbegi talks about these discussions that hope happen in opacity, and somehow, the Equality Act was said it was going to be onerous for business to implement. Tell me which small business does not find the Black Economic Empowerment Act onerous. The only people who don't find it onerous is big business. So the fact that the argument was that the one act required by the Constitution is onerous the nice to do it is not onerous, leaves us with a question mark about vested interests at the table where decision making is made. The Equality Act was consulted enormously. In fact, when we had to present it to Nelson Mandela, I remember the first time we had to present, we had to present a shell. 
And thank God he accepted that shell because it took a while. Even just coming up with the equality court, which I, 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 I came up with that idea and worked with Susan Masapu from the Department of Justice, was a novel idea. But again, implementing that act, half of it is like when a doctor says to you, you're sick, and they give you a script with multiple things you're supposed to do, and then you cherry pick. And then when you don't get better, you blame the doctor. There are many other laws that Dalla Oma led the process of. I've mentioned the Equality Act, but on gender equality, recognition of customary marriages act, we were led by him as we drafted that, those laws. Domestic Violence Act, Maintenance Act, and even other laws that are required by the Constitution, such as PAJA, the Promotion <coughs> of Access to Justice Act. And all of these laws were meant to make it easier to coexist in a space where there is fairness to all, and that's social justice. So we meet today to celebrate the legacy of a Democrat, but a social Democrat. At a time when we have to ask ourselves a question, are we a social democracy? Are we even a democracy? Democracy is a Greek word with two words combined, demos and kratos. Demos, people, kratos, power or rule, people's rule. And democracy first comes into Greece around the fourth century BC, when ordinary people like me and you were up in arms saying they didn't <coughs> like the way they were go governed, where there were a lot of burdens for the average person and yet a lot of privileges for the elites. So there was an uneven sharing of burdens and uneven sharing of the fruits of living together. John Rawls calls that social injustice and I agree with him. That's social injustice because where there's social justice, all groups in society share evenly the fruits of living together and the burdens of living together. It's a, it's a different story though. I disagree with John Rose around what is fair and what is not fair, but I'll talk very briefly about that. So let's go back to, to democracy. People were disillusioned and then democracy was brought in and people say they even studied in Africa because the African systems, they might have chiefs at the top who are hereditary, but what you don't realize is the rest of the system is very democratic. No meeting takes place without everyone having been invited. So it's direct democracy. And everyone gets an opportunity to talk. Of course, you will say most societies did not invite women. But that was the same thing in Greece when democracy was invented. <laughs> women were not part of the deal. People not owning property were not part of the deal and slaves were not part of the deal. But still, democracy was about giving people a system where there's nothing about us, without us, and for us all. Now here's the deal, dear colleague. The struggle in South Africa was just about that. Nothing about us, without us, and for us all. It wasn't we just want to remove white people so that black people can govern, or men so that women can govern, or um, heterosexual people so that um, a people from the LGBTQI could be involved. It was a system that gave greater space for people to be recognized as humans, everyone to count, to be represented in decisions that impact on their lives, that impose burdens on them, and that distribute privileges. It was also about a system in South Africa that would ensure that there is some restitution. And if you disagree with that, 
you have to look at the truth, um, the, sorry, the, the wording of the breach constitution, which is the, the interim constitution. The interim constitution is very clear that it was being adopted to change from what we are. So in the post embo the interim constitution says this, there is a need for understanding but not vengeance, for reparation but not for retaliation, a need for Ubuntu but not victimization. In S versus Makwanyane, judges such as Isma Mohammed, Yvonne Mohoro, Langa, uh, Madala, etc., then told us that through the interim constitution, we adopted the principle of Ubuntu. So Ubuntu was a principle that underpinned coexistence within the people of sub-Saharan Africa, Abandu. And at the core of that is respect for every human being, embracing the humanity of everybody, and shared humanity. So we talk about the interconnectedness of humanity and human solidarity, but that's not the core of it. The core of it is my humanity and your humanity have equal value. The respect I deserve and the respect you deserve should be the same, regardless of your <coughs> sex, your culture, your age, etc. So that's what we then, in the interim constitution, signed up for. And that was the future Dala Oma believed in as we reflect on his legacy. And I'll talk very briefly about how, besides those laws that I spoke about, that legacy or that belief in Ubuntu, that belief in shared humanity, that belief in democracy was put into action. He didn't speak one thing and walk in the opposite direction. I just want to give you an example of what happened this morning. I lost my cell phone, or I hope whoever took it will give it back on the flight because I was reading an article that I decided to incorporate in this speech. There was a heart-wrenching story of a rural woman, I will rename her now, Zodwa Magida. So Zodwa Magida went hiking at night, well not hiking, he was walking at night <coughs> after going to an event. It's a rural area, there are no roads. And somehow it was dark and there was fog, so he, she went off road. And whilst having gone off road, she fell and she hurt herself. She didn't know how bad it was. All she knew was she couldn't stand. This happened on the 17th of last month of October. For four days, she couldn't get any help. So on the 20th, a shepherd came over and, and took her. To get to the nearest hospital, she needed to hire a neighbor, one of the people in the neighborhood. They hired that person for 1,000 rand, which they still haven't paid, they're still owing it. The nearest hospital was 67 kilometers away. This is in the Eastern Cape. When she got to that hospital, the hospital said that it does not have orthopedic facilities to fix her displaced hip. So the reason she couldn't stand was because her hip had been displaced. She was in excruciating pain. So they said they could not help her, gave her 10 panados and sent her home. I've heard the stories 
hundreds of times during my term as public protector. I've heard similar stories now when at Stellenbosch University and Tuma Foundation, we're working with the people at a place called Emanzimele, 10 Panados. Then they said to her, she would have to be taken to a tertiary hospital, but there are no beds in that hospital. And in six weeks' time, the beds would open. In the meantime, she was sent home, and she's still waiting. President Mbeki once said there are two <coughs> South Africans, one that is black and one that is white. But today, there are two South Africans, one that is rich and one that is poor, one that is rural and one that is urban. I'm not saying the rich is not predominantly white and the poor is not predominantly black. Why am I saying the dividing line is primarily urban and rural and rich and poor? Is here's the next story. A few months ago, a colleague had a similar misfortune while hiking with another colleague. She fell in a rocky place and couldn't stand and realize that she had been hurt. An ambulance was called. It's an urban area. And she was taken to a private hospital. The doctors attended her and discovered that she had torn a ligament and damaged some nerves. She was immediately hospitalized. After a few days, she was operated on, and she stayed in hospital for a number of days, actually for more than a month, because doctors wanted to make sure that she was stable by the time she went home. After the hospital, she was put in a step-down facility for a considerable period of time. And once she was home, she still had access to physio and psychotherapy. So you will agree with me that there are two South Africans. We know that apartheid did create these two South Africans, a black South Africa and a white South Africa. But apartheid did not pretend, did not talk left and walk right. It talked right and it walked right. It wanted to create a society where blacks were unequals where their value, labor power, was extracted, and later their value as a market was extracted, and that happened. And, and that happened during colonialism, by the way. Most of it happened long before apartheid, because apartheid has been there for the last half a century. So all of this happened long before apartheid. But there was no double talk. There was a reality. So where's the double talk here? I want to before I go to the double talk, to say, what does the Constitution say? What did Dalla Oma do different to how this health problem is happening, okay? The Constitution is very clear. We are adopting this as a blueprint to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society that is based on three pillars, democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. And these are the things that he stood for as Dalla Oma. The Constitution also says that it is creating a foundation for freeing the potential of every person and improving the quality of life of every citizen. So when we did the first seminar on social justice, a round table, an expert round table, we had experts speaking to us about what has gone wrong in our democracy. Why have we become the most unequal society in the whole world, despite a constitution that says we're creating a socially just society? 
Why is our Gini co coefficient highest? Why are people stewing in, uh, in lack of access to health? Uh, Prof. Jamie Volmick dealt with the difficulty. One of the difficulties, where do we borrow ideas to drive our society? I've said Dala Ulmer borrowed ideas from societies with similar values to us. Denmark, Sweden, and to a certain extent, Germany. But where did they help people borrow their model? I don't know. But this is what happened. During apartheid, some of these rural hospitals were hospitals. <coughs> they had orthopedic surgeons, they had all of the things that were needed. I know this because when we went to Emanzimele, we had grown men and women crying tears and saying, during apartheid, when we went to the hospital and I had broken a leg, they could sew it back in. Then some Einstein came and decided efficiency is more important than responsiveness. But where were they getting their cue when the Constitution clearly says we're creating a society where everyone's potential is freed and every citizen's life is improved? So in this theory of theirs, it was for efficiency, you will put all of your resources in your tertiary hospitals and then leave those, some of those places with primary services, hence the panados. And this was the explanation. The explanation was user statistics. So if a place had only one Magida, this lady that I've spoken about who's gonna come and need an operation, then it does not deserve uh, those services. But there was no consideration that in Uppington, women had to drive 400 kilometers to the nearest hospital with services for maternal health at a time when, at that time when we were doing this research as the power protector, that was at a time when we were pursuing the Millennium Development Goals, where we were seeking to end maternal mortality and child mortality. And then you come with this that looks at only efficiency, and it's not looking at those three things that were important to Dalla Oma. And they come from a, a, a research that was done. Everyone must have read the book uh, uh, done by a uh, Pretoria University where people like Kada Asma <coughs> spoke about what we have inherited and what we're supposed to have. And Nancy Fraser is one of the people who said, for a social democracy, you're gonna need three things. You will need to recognize your people in their diversity. You will need to ensure that you respond to everyone's need and you'll need restitutive action where there are disparities. So health didn't look at the disparities part. And this is what you get, this incident in Eastern Cape. So what did Dalla Omar do differently because of the three Ps? Picture, everything is driven by what picture do I want? Principles and plan. But I would like them to add to those three Ps a C. It started with constitutional governance, which is before I decide what I like, what is my constitutional duty? And he understood that his constitutional duty was to create a society that is based on these three pillars, democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, where every citizen's life is improved and every person's um, potential is freed. So Justice Vision 2000 and the Customer Service Charter for Courts took into account not just efficiency, it took into account needs. So under his leadership, we were required to look at what should be a fair radius between the nearest court and every community. So it didn't mean we'll build all of those courts in one day, but it meant what's the ideal, so that whatever you build, you're building it like an architect. You start firstly with your picture. 
and then everything else is built according to that. So it was radius. Look at Justice Green 2000. We talk about every, so you can't, if you're living in Debord, in Stellenbosch, be closest to the nearest police station, nearest to court, while somebody who lives somewhere else uh, doesn't have the same thing. So the, his ideal was everyone should have the same radius to court. The second thing was something called a model court. So this is where, again, we differ from the Department of Health. 67 kilometers to a hospital that can't help you, that will give you panic. 67 kilometers. So his approach was each court should have certain basic requirements. And we went to Australia to look at what is an ideal court. Again, it didn't mean that those requirements would be met in one day. It meant whatever decision you make, will be vision driven. And I'm happy to see that to a certain extent those requirements have been met. And why did he do this? Two reasons, the Constitution, but secondly, a belief in the fact that everybody counts. That we fought against apartheid because women didn't count Black people didn't count. The LGBTQI community didn't count. Non-Christians did not count. So what, but what was the outcome of, in other words, what's the cost of injustice? The cost of injustice is a system where human rights fail consistently, not just by the state, because you then get a situation where each person is for themselves. Everyone is trying to grab as much opportunity for themselves as possible. So yes, part of why we want social justice is utilitarian. And you'll see that even in the United Nations, after the First World War, they came up with the Treaty of Versailles. When the Treaty of Versailles didn't work in 1919, they came in a, later with the UN Charter on, on, on no, before the UN, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. The UN Charter um, of 1945 dealt with what is due to every person. And John Rawls writes a book about this, um, A Theory of Justice, that when people occupy shared space, if you want sustainable cooperation, there has to be fairness to all. And I said to you, the only reason I differ from him is that he thinks fairness to all is, firstly, everyone should be treated equally, and secondly, to the extent that you might have to treat people unequally is to compensate for nature's arbitrary and equal gifts. So some of us are tall, some are short, some are super beautiful, some are not, some are fast runners, etc. some are super intelligent, some are not. So he, he thinks, uh, and some are disabled, some are not, that we have to compensate for that. But in my view, and I've got this long paper where I say, where he fails, because he says that's a, a, a relatively well-ordered society. So justice for all, or social justice, is you treat everyone equally uh, with all of the basic human rights and freedoms, but to the extent that you may have to tweak it, it's to make sure that you favor the, the least advantage. But when there's a clash between the first principle of freedom and um, advantaging the disadvantage, then you've got to choose freedom. The problem with that is that in a society like ours, and in a society that John Rawls wrote for, there never was only inequality because of nature's arbitrariness. John Rawls was a Harvard professor writing in America when he wrote a theory of justice, it was 1971. Already slavery had been there. Already women had been excluded from opportunity. And therefore, people who were left behind were not left behind because nature was cruel to them. 
People were left behind because of manufactured inequality. And the principle of restitution says when, there's, when you've taken something from someone to equalize opportunity, you've got to place them as close as possible to where they would have been, but for your, your unjust action. So that's the only time I differ with John Rawls. But he gives us at least tools, which I, I believe those tools somehow influenced Dalla Omar. And Dalla Omar's approach, therefore, in the Equality Act was both anti-discrimination plus restitutive action. But not even forcing people what to do. Just say, do an audit of where the inequalities are and progressively deal with it. Imagine 20 years into democracy, where would be if that law had been implemented? I want to just then go quickly to reimagining democracy. The first one is, what is the role of the state? Please read the financial mail this week. Well, I'm arguing that the state is not a business. It is a social enterprise. So the first thing the state should think about is what's good for the people. Of course, it doesn't mean you, uh, you deal with resources recklessly, but it means people first. But even with business, we're no longer following freedmen. At least one prime minister tried to do it a few <laughs> weeks ago, and she was fired immediately. So, but, most people don't follow Friedman, which uh, says everything should be done to favor business. The rest of us have to suffer. Even John Rawls says that theory is wrong, where um, uh, what you do for the, for, for the majority is justified suffering for, for the rest of humanity. So, the state is not a business is a social enterprise. But secondly, even business today, under the guidance of Kofi Annan and the UN Global Compact, is no longer following that approach of profit at all costs. They now talk about the triple bottom line. People, prince, people planet, and profit, because that unregulated, unbridled freedom to exploit, freedom to be cruel, which is what Luigi Taparelli, who invented social justice, said. You can't say it's just to give people freedom to be cruel. Because if your freedom is too much, there's none for me. Is, is it not so? So you've got to regulate freedom so that we all share in that freedom, hence the concept of shared humanity. So triple bottom line is, 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 is the approach that should have been taken. Um, so what would it mean then for the Department of Health and every other department is think about what do people need and how do we structure the resources to meet people's needs as much as possible. So those hospitals in rural areas should never have been closed. But what it also, though, exposes in terms of rethinking democracy is that we've put a lot of our resources in lawfare, which is people taking government to court. But usually people take government to court when government has acted and they don't like the way government has acted. So think about Subramani when dialysis was not provided and therefore the person was taken to court. There's been a few instances like road bomb where government was forced to push action, to, to do something. But there's great jurisprudence in countries such as India that is looking at government action where you perpetuate inequality through what looks objectively like an objectively rational, you rationalizing your resources. And I do think that if we took government to court today over the way the health system was restructured, we would win that case. 
But at Stellenbosch University, we say then in reimagining democracy, why must everything depend on people going to court? Why isn't it that those who exercise power on our behalf shouldn't be guided by the Constitution? So Constitution first, then a picture of the society you're trying to create, the principles to take you there, the plan matching that, and the action that matches that. And we've come up with an instrument called um, the Social Justice Impact Assessment Matrix. There's even a game that we are designing, Social Justice Explorer, where we're asking in the same way that we did with gender. In gender, we said to government, to business, to everyone, mainstream gender. So when you do anything, ask yourself, how will this impact on equality between women and women, women and men? Will it exacerbate existing inequalities or will it improve equality? That was gender mainstream. So all we're asking is now is mainstream equality for everyone in poverty. When you do something, ask yourself before you sign off on it, will it exacerbate existing disparities or will it improve on them? And why should you do that? Because the Constitutional Court has said in cases such as Minister of Finance versus Van Heerden, that government has a duty not to discriminate, but it also has a duty to advance equality. So it has a negative duty not to discriminate. It also has a positive duty. And Mosemege in Minister of Finance versus Van Heerden says, if you do not advance equality, then you're not complying with the Constitution. For me, there is a glimmer of hope, though. We have asked government to look at the UK Equality Act, Section 149, that says every action that is taken must be tested on will it discriminate against these designated groups, and secondly, will it reduce existing inequalities for those groups? So that's the first advice. And going with the UK, as part of my glimmer of hope, my immediate predecessor at Cities Alliance, who was the chair of the Cities Alliance before me, is former British MP, Claire Short. He once, she once said, justice is simple. Everyone has to be respected equally. Someone striving for justice a hundred years ago wouldn't see it as achievable that everyone in the world could have similar economic and social conditions. We now have the capital, the knowledge, the technology, the communications to make it completely feasible to set out to ensure that everyone in the world has the basics necessary to a decent life enough to eat, basic security, and basic decencies like access to education and health care. People will argue resources are scarce. I would say as part of reimagining democracy, ask yourself what kind of democracy is this constitution creating? Dalla Oma believed it was a social democracy and I believe so. So is it possible to take conditions or to take decisions that are based on social democracy in a difficult situation such as we're facing after COVID-19, a sluggish economy and um, the Ukraine war, etc.? In my article in Financial Mail, I refer those who govern to Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal of the 1930s. Which means in reimagining democracy, we have two choices. We can look at the old approach that says efficiency viewed in a narrow sense, because it's not efficient 
to cripple Magida, who will now become disabled. And therefore, she can't contribute to the economy, but the entire family is going to be affected if she was a breadwinner. And somebody in her community or in her family is going to be affected who now has maybe to leave her job to look after her. And then later, we have to feed her via social grants because we've disabled her. So even the argument of efficiency doesn't really work if you look at efficiency in a systems approach and in a macro way. So Roosevelt, thinking in a systems approach, chose to invest in people. And that was the approach that Dalla took, was that everyone deserves access to justice, not just physically, but also Justice Vision 2000 was talking about making it financially possible, but also tweaking the system so that it embraces the reality of every person. And as I said again, it was not something that was going to be done overnight. So we need to rethink democracy by imagining democracy in line with our constitution, which has three goals, democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. And a democracy that yields a better life for all citizens and freed potential of every person. Secondly, a democracy where things don't happen in opacity because we still don't know where BE came from, but we know where the Equality Act came from. And I'm not against black empowerment. I'm against black empowerment on the terms under the BE Act. Do you know that I once dealt with a case where Royal Bafukeng was whiter than APSA, according to the BE Act, because of the formula. And yet, the interim constitution talks about reparation, restitution. So how are you restituting a company that was historically advantaged? Only a formula designed by the beneficiary, only a formula designed with vested interests will come out with that kind of distorted approach. So rethinking democracy says, let's recenter our democracy for people such as Makita. Because if we don't do that, we will never know peace. But also, if we don't do that, we'll never know sustainable development. Because there's an African saying that says, if you want prosperity for a year, plant crops. If you want prosperity for 10 years, plant trees. If you want prosperity for 100 years and beyond, invest in people. And healthy people make successful nations. And healthy people include people who are healthy in terms of mental health. And mental health contributes to a healthy democracy. And to Dala Oma, we owe the duty to take the baton where he left it and play our part by walking the talk. Not say everybody matters, but when we make decisions, we make decisions that only advantage those that have means. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Tuli Maronsela. I think that was truly an inspiring and thoughtful lecture. You inspired us and called us to action. You helped us remember who Dalla really was, a man of integrity, a man who understood that apartheid was a manufacturer of inequality. He was a systems thinker. Um, you highlighted for us the fact that the Equality Act is not fully implemented, and it's a really interesting um, an important 
uh, provocation that you're making to all of us and to government that the Equality Act is not being fully implemented. And then the contrasting stories of Zodva Magida and your colleague, and contrasting the um, absurd inequality that we live with every day, and that is so stark in the experiences of so many, so many people in South Africa. And the double talk that government is displaying, talking left and acting right. And the obsession of the state with efficiency, which then removes humanity and dignity from people's access to services and to public services. So there's so many aspects of this lecture that we, I think, should reflect on, and it was very rich and very thought-provoking. Uh, so thank you very much for um, putting so much passion, energy, and thought and research into this contribution. It's truly, truly appreciated. Um, Professor Marcella has kindly agreed to take a few questions so we can, we're in an academic environment, we like to engage and uh, ask questions and make inputs. Um, we've got only time for a few. I'm, I will not be able to accommodate all the questions that will be, that will be coming up uh, because we want to listen to the choir um, and they are also, uh, they are starting to look a bit tired and <laughs> they need to get back to their exams and their studying. Um, so I want to ask if we can just look at, at two aspects and we agree on two things when we take the questions. One is that we keep it short, keep it short and to the point. There are many of us here and we like to take as many questions as we can and take one round of questions and ask Professor Maroncella to respond. And also let's keep the questions focused on the lecture. I know there's many things that we would like to ask Professor Maroncella about all kinds of things happening around us and in Parliament with the current incumbent of the office that she used to hold and um, all those things. But let's focus it on, on the lecture because that's really why, why we are here. So I think I'll take three or four questions and then uh, ask Professor Maroncella to, to respond. So maybe we can start here in front, person there in the green uh, top. If you can ask your question and keep it as short as you can. Thank you so much. And maybe just give your name briefly before you ask the question. Damaris Kiwi from the Community Engagement Unit. Um, Prof. Madasela, thanks for uh, insightful and taking us back to the 2020 justice document. I think for me, when I saw the invitation was exactly that because um, Dula Omar took us as civil society together in the room and that is where led a lot of legislation was put together, but very little was implemented when things went wrong. So my question to you would be, is that the reason our CGE looks the way it looks at the moment? And we are challenged by the dysfunctionality of most of our Chapter 9 institutions. Thank you. So much. That was wonderfully short. I really appreciate that. Let's go to the back there, the gentleman in the red top. Over to you. Also keep it short and to the point, if you can. And your name, please. Okay. My name is Aces Azanugutlimayapi. My question is quite short. Firstly, public protest, pro advocate, pub, former public protector, I want to find out about how possible is that that why it you in this space and then we are told about we must get certain qualifications to get certain titles, but when uh, you don't have a scholarship in professorship, but today you are called a public professor with just an LLP, no masters, but you're a professor. But here, in a student space, we have to get LLPs, masters, doctorates, and then still publish, but when I jumped all of that, so I don't understand how that came about. Secondly, it's quite shocking bah, that you have a view on Many things, but some things we don't have, like on, and on ENCA, we don't have a view on ENCA, but we're one of the proponents, but we're calling for the closure of ANN7, saying it's a propaganda machinery. But ENCA, it's worse, just that ENCA is pushing a certain racial agenda. And as I'm about to conclude, out of the, out of the public protectors that we've had, the current public protector advocate, Busimu Kwebani has been getting clean audits 
You've never gotten any, not even one clean audit. Instead, you've been asking for more budget allocation, but then you're still regarded as the best. Don't you ask yourself, but why that is? Because obviously, and yeah, as I'm closing, in your state capture report that on, on references, quoted encyclopedia, quoted News 24, that even a first year student will know by quoting encyclopedia is automatic disqualified. You can never quote encyclopedia. But when as a law graduate, you were able to quote that. In your state capture report, you've, ne you've, you've, nev you've not mentioned the company Glencoe. Today, Glencoe is flagged in many countries, in US, in Latin America, in South America. But in your state capture report, there's no Glencoe that you see here. All that you hear is Zuma Gupta, Zuma Gupta. But then people that have actually stolen billions, trillions, are not counted there. So I don't understand your question. Thank you. Of state Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you didn't really agree to the, uh, uh, comply with the agreement that we had. Um, but OK, you've had your platform. Thank you so much. Let's go to the back there, uh, the lady with the green top. Over to you. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Councillor Patricia van der Ras, the MMC for Community Services and Health. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Um, and I've listened to um, everything that you have said. Um, but we are in a position where we are walking into the future. And I really want that guidance because I am blessed to be in leadership as a woman of color. Um, in the city of Cape Town. But we need those guidance or those steps to lead us forward into the direction because I lead with passion. Um, and I know the opening remarks of our MC was um, we, have, we don't have that civil society or we don't have the servants, the public servants that leads with passion. And I'm blessed to be one of those servants that leads with passion for people and genuine passion. So I want that guidance into what do we do to remain relevant without losing focus on the, the core picture that we have. For example, for women um, having the equal opportunity, for people being able to have equal access to health facilities, for people being able to go to our different facilities and have um, interaction, recreational activities, that type of thing. So if you can please just give us some guidelines in that regard. All right, can I have a look at the other hand? So there's the gentleman next to you. Maybe he can also ask his question. Keep it brief, please. Uh, good evening. Gillian Bosman from the Provincial Parliament, as well as a VIT student. Uh, Professor Madoncella, what I'd like to know, with the new preferential procurement regulations coming out next week, I think, how do we use regulations more effectively and put better guidance in place for ministers, um, MECs as well as MMCs to make better decisions once laws exist already. Because how is it in a country where we've got massive unemployment and we've got big co um, companies looking for construction deals, but our government is still employing McKinsey's, we're still employing um, Chinese companies to build roads, all because the regulations allow for it. So the core of the question is, what is it that we need to do to build in the next steps and to give the guidance that the MMC is asking for to enable not just the legislators to make better laws, but also the implementers, the executive, to actually translate that into functional regulations that are complementary to those laws? Okay, thank you very much. The uh, gentleman here with the white shirt has been having his hand up very consistently, so over to you, sir. Also, uh, keep it brief, please. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Prof, uh, for um, the lecture. Um, firstly, mine, it's a comment. Um, uh, oh, firstly, I'm Swule Loganda, um, second year LLM student, um, the law faculty. Um, one of um, the things, it's a comment that I would like uh, from what you have said, Prof, about BEE. Um, I think it, it's one of the things that in my research I, would, I want to or I strive to speak about that we have the system and government who speaks on BEE and all those stuff. And when we get people of color to boldly speak about how it only serves the few and those that are close with the government, we are labeled as sellout and all those stuff, whereas it doesn't serve to address the issues of social justice. But my question um, to you, Prof, is what is the role um, of UWC, institutions of higher learning, in driving these conversations, in trying to live up to um, Dula Omar's um, 
uh, legacy in terms of addressing these issues that are happening within the ANC because we can't even camouflage the issues ANC. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for one more. That's really all we can accommodate. There's a hand there at the back. Uh, and I look forward to a precise, short, and on-point question. Yes, uh, mine is very short. Uh, Professor, what is your opinion on the relocation of uh, the seat of parliament bill? What is your opinion on that? They want to move parliament from uh, Cape Town to Tswane, I think. What's your opinion on that? Thank you so much. It would be wonderful to entertain all the questions that are, are arising, but we uh, will not be able to do so. So let's hand over to Professor Maroncella for, for her response. Thank you, dear colleagues, for those responses. It does show that you are at an academic institution. The last time I came to UWC to present the Bishop to, to lecture, I wasn't engaged. The event was hijacked and people came up with t-shirts and I was served because I understood in my generation protest was the language of the disempowered and we were disempowered and therefore protest was our language. And, but in these spaces where people have an opportunity, unlike in Iran or other places where protest can get you killed, you have an opportunity to protest through speech. And, and therefore, I thank you for in, engaging me very clearly and very intellectually. The first question was around uh, Justice Vision 2000 and, and, and asking about this dissonance between Dala's legacy of meaningful engagement of all stakeholder communities, whether disagreeing with them or agreeing with them, this is what's happening in the CGE. Dear colleague, I don't know enough about what's happening in the CGE, but I can tell that it's paining you, and it pains me too. And one of the difficulties of groups that have been excluded from power is that sometimes when you get to power, you guard it jealously and, and push too hard when you feel being disagreed with. And then maybe the ability to engage meaningfully is diminished. I, I don't know what's happening in the CGE. I do think that it is said because that institution still has a major role in helping us to reimagine democracy as a space of shared humanity where the worth of men, women, and gender unassigned people is equally valued. And the CGE, together with the women's ministry, are supposed to play extremely important roles. What I can say is we need to just maybe, as civil society women, have a sit down with the people in the CGE to find out what's happening, colleagues, can we help you? And um, is there a, a, a way of isolating shared values and shared vision and then dealing with how we disagree with each other? Uh, in ways that do not sabotage our shared commitment to the future. And this, dear colleague, also takes me to coalitions. I think coalitions are failing because of failure of firstly agreeing on what's common ground, other than we're trying to kick, us, kick out someone else, like a lot of them just want to kick out the ANC, other than agreeing on who we don't like, what do we agree about? What are we building? And this is where for us, this C triple P A approach could help. What does the constitution require us to do? What picture do we see at the end of our partnership? What are the principles that will govern us as we move towards that future? And what are the principles that will help us to deal with our disagreements? So principles on 
what will take us forward, and principles on how we're going to deal with our dis disagreements in ways that are not dis uh, destructive and action. At the Tuma Foundation, we have a training for leaders that maybe the CGE could benefit from. And I stumbled on this together with the team at the Pub Protector team. When we connected the dots backwards, as Steve Jobs says we do, was to look at what made us, it is, why, what made it possible for us to survive the storms and not start cannibalizing on each other. And what made the organizations that we oversaw as public protector move forward, some of them, like telecom. We found that it was those that operated on what we now have termed the epic leadership code. Firstly, start with leadership. Where am I leading myself and others to? Where am I influencing, what am I influencing people to think and act towards? So that's the leadership question. The second question is ethics. What is the right thing to do? So ethics is not just about honesty and dishonesty, it's also about fairness. So every time when we think about values, we all know thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not capture the state, thou shalt not be corrupt. But we also need to know don't favor people if you're a leader. And it's been shown that it demoralizes teams, but it also makes people feel justified in acting in a belligerent way. And, and there's a case that was mentioned by um, Bob Geldof in, in a book that was written by Kate Robinson and her daughter. Was when two monkeys were given the same task, the first monkey initially performed the, the task excellently, thinking that the reward system of uh, um, what was it being given? It was getting cucumbers. It thought that was the best thing. And then when it then realized that there were two of them, and then it saw the other monkey being given grapes, and they liked grapes, it thought the, the reward system had changed, so it expected grapes. When it didn't get grapes, it became belligerent threw away the, the work it was supposed to do. So again, ethics is not just about be honest, it's about treat everyone uh, fairly as well. The second one is purpose driven. When we run these organizations, whether it's CGE, public protector, what's the purpose of the power you're given? I once got a minister who said, um, now we're truly, you know that when these people uh, when we go to their country, they treat us badly, and uh, why should we treat them fairly? And I was just saying, but that's not how the power has been given. And then she said something remarkable, which was, um, when one person is rude and another one is polite, don't you treat the polite person better? I said, no, as a power protector, we were making sure that people are trained to understand that the power we've been given is to serve the people and nothing else. The purpose of your power is to serve people. It's never to protect yourself. And so the purpose driven just to make sure that the power you exercise is not to settle schools. Everything you do with public power is, should be governed by the purpose for which it was granted. And the courts have said the same. The third part, and I also don't exercise power you don't have. And Gandla was about that, where you think there's a need, but you don't have the power, authority to give this person benefits. And then you give them the benefits. No, you can't give them the benefit even if there's a need. You firstly, in terms of administrative law, have to create the power to do that. So the third one is impact consciousness. And as part protector, I was once being attacked from all manner of things. Um, I think the latest one is the one I don't have qualifications and I don't deserve to be a professor, but I'm gonna to get to that. But before that, I was supposed to be, um, uh, I was prosecuted for being fraudulent because I said here in Cape Town, the powers of the part protector are binding and in Pretoria, I said the powers of the pop protector are not binding. So that's a legal opinion. That's not a fact. So it can't be perjury. But they had senior people in the, um, 
the hawks, when the hawks had been repurposed during state capture and were persecuting whistleblowers, and they, I was also persecuted. Uh, even after I, so but impact consciousness was, one of the lawyers said to me, why don't you just simply say you changed your mind? You were advised by different lawyers in Cape Town and different lawyers in Pretoria. But the very same person who was advising me would know that I never changed my mind. So next time if I sit on a podium like this, they will say, we wonder if she's telling the truth. Because we know that when she's in a tight spot, she lies. My team would have known that I never ever believed that the powers of the power protector are not binding when she chooses to use the, the binding dimension. So they too would have known that, oh, this place we lie when we're in a tight spot. So I would be, have been giving them, unconsciously giving them permission to lie. So if you're a leader, you have to be impact conscious. Everything you do has consequences. And, and one co colleague was reminding me of what I always say to people is everything has a price. It's an integrity, it's pay now or pay later. If you pay later, it's expensive and painful. Pay now, it's painful, but not as painful as paying later. And then the third one is committed to serve everyone. Why the commitment to serve is important is that often people, when they go into leadership, they expect everyone, including the team, to agree with them. In other words, we're looking for the applause outside us. But if you're committed to serve, yours is to serve, whether you're applauded or not, it doesn't matter, because the, plus, the applause is within yourself. So that's epic leadership, which I do think that people in coalitions and people in, in the CGA and young people who want to go to politics might, uh, might benefit from. Then there's... Um, the lady who, um, then there's a colleague who says, why is it that I have been appointed as a professor without um, a, a, a degree, a, post, um, a postgraduate collocation? Firstly, my LLB degree is postgrad. It's not the four-year LLB. I did a four-year BA law at the University of Swaziland, which is now a SWAT. Secondly, then I did a two-year LLB at Fitz University. Thirdly, I did an advanced leadership certificate at Harvard for a year. <laughs> Fourthly, I am the architect of the Equality Code, among many other things. The sole architect of the Equality Code. It required <laughs> the same. Fifthly, 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 the Equality Act under Dalla Omar was coordinated by myself. I did all of the research. At the end of that Equality Act, I had to defend it in Parliament. Read Hansard. That's more than defending a thesis. In fact, one of the people who have accused me of having no scholarship got his LLD I mean, his doctorate on writing about the fact that apartheid infanticized black people. That's okay. I'm not going to take a dim view of that. But my research has come out with things. The O.R. Tambo Declaration on minimum standards for ombudsmen, ask everyone. I wrote it all by myself and then came to the team to ask my colleagues because we had given it to uh, a, a, a task team and they didn't have the opportunity to write it. I wrote it and today it's quoted at the United Nations. They all are time for declaration on minimum standards. And since then, the UN has now also come up with other standards for I can, and then, two books that I wrote on gender equality, say. On gender mainstreaming, they are used at SAMD. So if you want to know about gender mainstreaming, there are two books that I wrote on gender mainstreaming, one in 2002, the other one in 2006. One is on gender management and leadership, one is on. Is on. So, and then of other publications. I was among the first people before the Constitution to 
mainstream the whole idea of substantive equality. And one of my publications is with two lessons we see, and, and others, one is about judges and gender. But to say that I had no scholarship before I came to Stellenbosch is a blatant lie. Check that book on gender mainstreaming. I can send you a copy, say, and then you will see at the back of it a whole lot of things I did, including the base document for the women's ministry. That's research that eventually had to be dealt with by cabinet. But I coordinated the training of judges, the bench book for equality courts is my brainchild in my coordination, the resource book for equality court clerks. And did I mention that I'm the inventor of the Equality Court? <laughs> so, then on the question, sorry, then the question of the public protector and clean audits. Many institutions, including PRASA, that we investigated would waive the clean audit at us and say, we're getting clean audits. Clean audits, you get them for two things. Making sure that your systems are proper. But secondly, auditing does not check everything. It looks at 10%. So here is why I didn't get a clean audit thing. When I came in as a public protector, we got a qualified audit. I think it is a disclaimer, actually, not even a qualified audit. So a disclaimer is when your books are not in place. Because under Mushwana, who had been getting good reviews, the CFO had died just before the transition. So as Pop Protector, the first report that you, you present is your, your predecessors. Secondly, every year, and I ask you to go and check this in the Papotector, every year, the Auditor General looks at a diminishing number of things that were putting you into trouble. The interesting thing is that there was a dis why we didn't get a clean audit with two things. One was there was the system that Advocate Mushwana had introduced, and I make no judgment against Advocate Mushwana, but the system was not working, so we're struggling with impair it or not impair it. But as long as it was in the system, we couldn't get a, a clean audit, and we were trying to work at it to make sure that we could resuscitate it, because more than 10 million had been spent on that system. That is a court management system. That's number one. The second thing, there was a disagreement up with the Audit General about the hiring of lawyers. The interesting thing is clean audit versus no clean audit. When I introduced the, this, the, the, the thing of getting lawyers outside and then creating a system for them, was I insisted that you quantify your work in advance and you tell us in advance how much we're gonna pay you. Because we can't sit and decide how many hours have you worked. If you say you worked 24 hours, I don't know if you know the joke about the lawyer who died young and went to heaven and asked St. Peter, say, God promised me a long life, but here am I young. And then St. Peter looked at the charge, at the, the fees, and said, according to the numbers you worked here for fees, you're actually more than 100 years old. So we, we're not able to do that. So we created that system. So how you get better with the auditing thing is the baseline that a person has created for you. So for me, for example, I then, based on all of this, because based on the disagreement with the Auditor General, we changed the rules. Based on our experiences, we created even rules for uh, an, a standard operating protocol for investigations. 
So you do better because you stand on shoulders of giants. I've never claimed to have been the best public protector. I even disagree with those that say my predecessors were poor. I say they were great because if they were terrible, I would be like ESCOM today. <laughs> because if somebody leaves the system in shambles, then you start with fixing the system instead of going into high performance gear. And then that takes me into, I, I deliberately didn't want to go into state capture because I wanted to focus on Dala's legacy of social democracy. But you've brought it, so. <laughs> Which I had avoided it, not because it's just, we can't just always be only thinking about one thing. But state capture was specifically we were asked to investigate whether it's okay that the president had a relationship with the Guptas and that that relationship with the Guptas gave benefits to himself, his two children, Duduzane and Duduzile, his wives and everyone else. And in that process, after Duduzane had been fired, from being an ordinary employee of the Guptas, as soon as President Zuma was appointed president of the ANC, he was now good enough to be a director. Instantaneously, he wasn't good enough to be an ordinary clerical guy. As soon as his father becomes the president of the ANC, he's good enough to be a director. So that doesn't matter. People's children can be hired. But how do you explain that a company that is in distress because it claims it doesn't have money gets replaced by a company that can't even buy the company. And you take government money to give to the company that is coming in as a rescuer. In what planet, say, does that make sense? So if these people don't even have money to buy the company that they want to manage, how are they your rescuer? And the only thing that qualifies them is the company's co-owned by the Guptas and the president's son. So if you want to take me on that, it was not about what had happened before then. It was about specifically, is it okay to take government's money and buy a company for, simply because the others are the president's son and his friends? Secondly, Never in this, the history of this country had the whole cabinet been asked to go and tell the banks how to do their job. But because the company that was involved was co-owned by the president's son and the Guptas, the whole a committee of the, of the cabinet was dispatched to go and deal with this matter. Cabinet is supposed to deal with policy, not transactional issues. So, sir, thank you for asking that question, but as I have indicated, the issue was not about Glencoe. The issue was at the point of contact. Should government money had been used to give to the company co-owned by the president's son, so it wasn't, I must then go investigate any other thing that happened leading to that point. That was, and then you say, no, Glencoe has since been found to have been criminal elsewhere. If I use your logic, I would say, if Glencoe was criminal here in this country, the very same people that have found criminality elsewhere should have found criminality here. But that was not my investigation, say. But lastly, you say we refer, we did, it wasn't the encyclopedia say, it was Wikipedia. What we do, what you do as an investigator, you deal with evidence and information. So please say, read again the report. Where you deal with information, you deal with any information that you can find. Okay, this one said this, this one said this. Then you have evidence. Evidence is the section that says this is verified. So please that read that report again.
So I hope I've answered your questions, but to, to bring back to the last one asked me about BEE, and, um, oh no, say, you are saying when we question BEE, we call sellouts. It depends on how we're questioning it, say. When we say restitution is wrong, then it's okay to call a sellout. Because a lot of people that have benefited from affirmative action, even in America, Clarence Thomas, do you think he would have gotten that position if there wasn't affirmative action? So people benefit from these restitutive measures, but then they become the loudest mouth in speaking against restitutive measures. So I want to say to you, I am not against restitutive measures. What I've questioned tonight is the formula. Mm -hmm. And I say the formula is toxic for small businesses, black or white. And I'm saying it has a narrow field of beneficiaries. But beyond that, it has been mostly political economic empowerment. Yes. Tell me one politically connected family that's not rich today, like highly politically connected. And then you take, there, there used to be the, the small businesses that were there before BE. They were not the ones that Standard Bank, Anglo-American and et cetera invited them to come and become shareholders. Why is it that those were invited to become shareholders where people had never run a company? The people who have been invited to be in boards are not necessarily people who have run anything. Why is, is it accidental that the people that tend to be invited in boards are somehow related to politicians? So this for me is the crux of the question from John Rawls. In fact, this is my last story about John Rawls. John Rawls says in his theory of justice, the people who have to decide how are we going to dispense opportunities and burdens in our society have their memory wiped off so that they don't know whether they're rich or poor, able-bodied or, or, or disabled. And this is to make sure that there's no vested interest, that the people make this, this, that decision purely based on merit. But we know we can't wipe off our memories. So how do we make sure that the decisions that we're making are fair, sunshine. Let's make sure that there's no opacity. Secondly, inclusion, which was the Dalam Oma option. Let's make sure that everyone is at the table, which is this whole thing about democracy being nothing about us, without us, and for us all. Thank you. Thank you so much for engaging with those questions, frankly, robustly, and transparently. Uh, you didn't dodge any question. Uh, I take my hat off to you, and uh, you answered them with true scholarship. Uh, so thank you for that. We're going to listen to the choir, but before we do that, uh, we want to just hand over a small present uh, to Professor Maroncella to thank you for your speech tonight. And Handed over by the inimitable Debbie Gordon, who has been on top of every detail of this event. So thank you, Debbie, uh, and thanks, Professor Maroncella. Uh, let's listen to the choir. Over to the LBC choir for a next song. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much to the EWC choir. We will soon release them to go back to their studies and preparing for their exams. Uh, but you really graced this evening with beautiful song and dance, and we really enjoyed everything that you, um, that you rendered tonight. So I think now is the moment that Auntie uh, Frida has been promising us about. <laughs> uh, the vote of thanks will be delivered by Ramiz Omar. Over to you, Ramiz. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ramiz Omar, and I'm the grandson of the late Dal Omar. Much has already been said about his and his colleagues' immense contribution to our democracy, but the opportunities that have been opened up for our generation as a result of this, at times, for their bitter struggles. The only additional insight uh, that I'd like to make is my recognition of his role as a grandfather Notwithstanding his frenetic schedule, I never felt neglected. In fact, my vivid memories now serve as an anchor for the values that he represented and the principles that I seek to em emulate and express in my life. In closing, I'd like to thank the funders, the Hans Seidel Foundation, with a special mention for Ms. Marlene Barnard and Mr. Hans Bühler, the Weber Wenzel's attorneys, uh, and in particular, Ms. Nasley Holland, Weber Wenzel has sponsored each of the memorial lectures so far. And then to our speakers, our keynote speaker, Professor Tuli Manusela, for your insights tonight. The UC Re UCT Rector, sorry, UWC Rector, Professor Tyrone Pretorius. I was practicing not doing that earlier, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, the UWC Choir, led by Sibo Seso uh, Nzeza. It was a wonderful performance tonight, thank you so much as well as UWC's institutional advancement, in particular, Mr. Hardy Zacharias, Mr. Gina Alfred and his team from the UWC Audiovisual Services for enabling the sound and the live stream during the event, 
and the UWC Assets Department, in particular Mr. Walid Taylor, for supplying the key assets required for the event, as well as the staff of the UWC Public Health for helping uh, with the venue tonight. And then of course, Mrs. Debbie Gordon of DOI, the lead organizer, as Yab keeps telling me without her, this event wouldn't be possible, so big thank you to her. And finally, for the support of the entire Omar family and all our guests here tonight, in particular my grandmother, Farida Omar, whose commitment to ensuring the legacy of Dal Omar is never forgotten. Uh, she said I need to mention this story when I come up here today. She was quite uh, vociferous and on the phone with me last night. Uh, she actually stopped me from showering for about 15 minutes of standing there. <laughs> but. Um, even in his busy schedule as a minister and all these other commitments. Uh, as children, we used to walk into the house and my grandmother used to get quite annoyed at this because the first thing he did was us being obsessed with the Lion King at the time. Um, he would stand on all fours, this is a minister of our country, <laughs> standing on all fours and my brother and I would jump onto his back and run around the house essentially for hours. I think my grandmother was a bit worried about his back at that point. Um, <laughs> So it just shows that not only uh, can you be a great person, a leader in our country, uh, but you can also be a great family person. And I think that's the most that we took in terms of the values that he left for us. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ramiz. Thanks for bringing the human side to Dalla Omar's legacy also into this, into this evening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Nothing more left for me to say other than thank you very much for attending. Please join us for some eats and drinks outside. Uh, travel safely and see you at the next Omar Memorial Lecture. Thank you.